All right, good morning, everybody. How y'all doing? Awesome, man, love it. Uh, great response there, praise Jesus. Uh, yeah. Hey, uh, if, uh, if you're just joining us, we are in... Uh, week four of this spiritual practice of generosity, and uh, I'm really excited to dive into this kind of last and final week with you. You know, in week one, we talked about this idea of, uh, of how God owns it all, and we're just his caretakers. And so part of it is just realizing that, having a, a mindset to pay attention to the fact that like everything we have has been a gift from the Father of the heavenly lights. He rains them down upon us because of his goodness and his grace, because he is a generous God. And then also in week two, we kind of transitioned to this idea that we need to identify some places maybe where we could cut some spending because we gotta watch out for greed. Right? Like Jesus says in his, in his teachings, you got to watch out for greed because, um, man, like if we're going to be generous people, greed is going to, is going to be a, a space that, or, or a thing that comes after our hearts and, and vows for our attention. And then last week, we talked about this idea, how it is just a, a flagship mark of, of Jesus and his followers that they believe that there was more joy and giving than receiving. And so uh, today we're going to wrap up this practice and we're going to focus our attention back on Luke chapter 12, which we've seen a couple different times throughout the series. But we're going to focus our attention back to Luke chapter 12 and a parable from Jesus uh, that... Uh, that is really uh, pretty awesome. If you have a Bible, you brought one with you, turn over there to Luke chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the seats in front of you. You can turn to page 845 or 846. Um, or if you have a you know, cellular telecommunication device, you can always you know, pull that up, use that, whatever uh, might work for you. Uh, but, but we're gonna be in Luke chapter 12. We're gonna start in verse 13. And... Uh, Jesus is with a crowd of people, and someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who, who appointed me the judge and arbiter between you? So right from the outset, you begin to see Jesus is uh, he's, he's brought into this dispute with a guy and his brother over money. And this is important. It's important that we see that money has a ability, if we let it, if we give it that power, it has the ability to, to take um, and divide relationships, especially amongst family. Maybe some of you have experienced this. Maybe some of you have had experience with this with brothers and sisters or aunts and uncles or cousins or whatever. But, but money oftentimes, if not uh, put in its proper place in our hearts and in our lives, can, can tend to divide us. And here is a brother uh, who's divided with his brother. And he says, Jesus, I want you to tell my brother how to handle this. <laughs> And Jesus is like, whoa, whoa, like, uh, that's not really what I'm here to do. It's not really my thing. But he does say uh, what we talked about a couple weeks ago in verse 15, where he says, then he said to them, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. We should all know this verse pretty well by now, right? After studying it a couple weeks ago, but this is just Jesus saying, look, hey man, like, just watch out, because the good life, the life that I have for you, the life that I want to give you, it's not found in all of that stuff. It's not found in wealth or anything else here on earth. He's not saying any of those things are bad. He's not saying any of those things are, are hor horrible things or things that, you know, we shouldn't enjoy or shouldn't like, but essentially he's saying that's not where the good life is found. That's not where you're going to find the life that I have for you. And then Jesus tells a story in verse 16. He says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. Pay attention to the fact that this man is already rich, okay? And then he says, he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. 
And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. This story Jesus begins telling is about a wealthy man. He's already wealthy. He's a wealthy landowner, and he has more than enough money. He has more than enough to make ends meet. And he realizes he might have more than enough to make ends meet, but he doesn't have enough to store all the surplus and all the extra. And so he says, well, what am I gonna do? And instead of being content, like we talked about in this series, instead of being content, he says, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna tear down my old barns and I'm gonna build bigger barns to hold all of my surplus crops and grain, which obviously equates to riches and money in his time. And he says to himself, he says, now I can take it easy. I love how this line is translated in some other translation. The CEV, it's translated, live it up, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. In the message, Eugene Peterson uh, paraphrases it this way, you've got it made, now you can retire. Take it easy and have the time of your life. This was the life philosophy of the pagans of Jesus' time. And so what Jesus is doing is he's saying, this person was not following God. The word pagan is not a a way of saying someone was bad. It was just a way of saying that they weren't a follower of God. And so this this is Jesus saying, hey, this is what they go after. This is what the pagans go after. They're just not following God. And two Harvard Business School graduates, uh, they wrote a book called God and Money, and they retold this parable in a modern way, which I found really uh, appealing, actually. Uh, So take a look at it. It says, the stock options belonging to a manager vested after a major run-up in share price, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I already have enough saved up to send my kids to college, my house is paid off, and I've already maxed out my 401k every year. And he said... I will do this. I will open up an investment account and create a passive income portfolio and I'll exercise my options and put the money there. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have a big enough portfolio to be financially independent, retire early, plan some vacations and play golf. And you guys know, if you know me at all, how good that sounds, right? <laughs> like, you know that, like, when you start talking about vacations, I like vacations. And when you start talking about golf, I really like golf. And when you start talking about vacations that have golf, now you got me, you know? Like, that's the, that's the thing. And if you know, like, man, but as good as that life sounds, right? As good as all of that seems, Jesus calls this man a fool. Look at verse 20. He says, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. And this is how it is and will be for whoever stores up them things for themselves but is not rich toward God. Meaning that if you want to max out your life and build bigger barns and store up those riches that you have here on earth, it's just not going to mean jack squat when it's all said and done. It would be a colossal waste of time, energy, and resources because it could all be gone tomorrow. And it is clear by what Jesus is saying that you can be a financial success in our world and be a complete and utter spiritual failure. And this is how it is for those who store up for themselves treasures on earth but are not rich toward things of God. But I also want to understand something about Jesus' culture. Because the, the group of people in who Jesus is speaking to, I mean, the majority of people that are that are around Jesus at this time and living in Jesus' world at this time, they're, they're not wealthy folks. They're mostly poor peasants. Very, very few people made it into the upper class, much like today. But even the middle class was a very, very small, select few people that, that were able to pay their bills and owned a house, but they kind of lived paycheck to paycheck, so to speak. They made up about 10% of Jesus' population, about the population when Jesus was around. And about 90% were poor. They relied on other people's charity in order to make ends meet and provide their basic needs. 
And so the thought, Jesus is telling this story, and the thought of someone who would have all of that ability to bless so many people and yet decides to hoard it and hold it for themselves, neglecting the majority of people in the world, the image bearers of God that we're called to love and care for, it would be foolish to do such a thing. And yet, the sad thing is, and I think, is, is that the villain in Jesus' story is often an American hero. The villain in Jesus' story is somebody that we oftentimes aim to be like. <laughs> More often than we would like to maybe even admit right now. But Jesus talks to his disciples directly in verse 32. After he tells this parable and this story, he says to them this. He says, don't be afraid, little flock. Your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions. Give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes near and moth destroy. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, many of us, we're not these wealthy landowners. We're not this guy in the story. We're, we're people who can't really build bigger barns, don't have the money to build bigger barns. We're just people who are working, living life, paying bills, trying to make ends meet. And this is probably a lot like most of the guys who follow Jesus. Most of the people who Jesus called to be his disciples. And yet he doesn't give them a, he doesn't give them a pass on being generous just because they're trying to make it. Instead, instead he he says, "You know because you've been with me." You know that my father is pleased to give you everything. He's going to give you the kingdom. He's going to give it to you all. You just have to trust him. Because he's a good, loving, and generous God. He's going to take care of you. That's his advice to the disciples. And then he tells them, sell it all. You who don't, don't have barns and bigger barns to store up surplus, you who have just enough, sell it all and give it to the poor. This, this is going to be like kind of scary, right? I mean, if, I mean, you and I, we're like those people that he's telling to sell everything they have and give it to the poor. And he's saying that when you do, God's gonna give you something that's truly worthwhile, treasure in heaven. We talked about this last week a little bit about how our heart is tied to our money and how our heart often follows our money. And when we spend our money on things that won't last, our hearts will be racked with fear and greed. But when we, when we give it away, then this is Jesus' solution to the problem. When we give it away, we we become more free and we become more trusting and we become more of the people that God calls us to be. And the fascinating thing about these disciples is they actually did it. They actually did it. Look at Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two, it says this, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and gave to anyone who had need. In Acts chapter four, we see about this. It says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. You see that? They didn't think of things as their own. They thought of everything belongs to God. They understood stewardship. And they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them 
and brought the money from the sales and put them at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. The church, the disciples of Jesus, the most amazingly generous people that you would ever meet, they never let anybody go without. Tim Keller makes this keen observation about this. He says, the early church was strikingly different from the culture around it in this way. The pagan society was stingy with their money and promiscuous with its body. A pagan gave nobody their money and practically gave everybody their body. And the Christians came along and gave practically nobody their body and gave practically everybody their money. (laughs) Throughout the history of Christianity from then until now, generosity and radical generosity of that has been a flagship mark of Christians and followers of Jesus. Even today... The most generous demographic of people in in the working class world are Christians, percentage-wise. Maybe not an amount because not all Christians make a ton of money. But percentage-wise, they give more of their percentage of their money away um, than any other demographic of people. And because... um, Because our government has has taken on such... uh, a task of caring for those who are in need, um, it's easier now, though, than ever before to withdraw from helping people who really, truly are in need. We can just rely on tax dollars and legislation to take care of those people who are in the biggest need. But that's not what the... Something more... You know, the term social justice in our world, it gets kind of this mixed bag of emotions when you start talking about it, especially in the church. But this is what the church was doing. I mean, they were using their resources that God had blessed them with to bless others, love people, care for people. And so like social justice really is like this mark of the church to make sure that everyone is, is provided for and seen as an image bearer of God and a child of God and loved and taken care of. And that should still be the way it's done today. One of the most puzzling things that I see with Christians, though, is that when, when we hear things like this, like, hey, you should probably sell some of your stuff and give it to the poor, we're very, very quick, very quick to rationalize that away. We're very, very quick to, to just dismiss that altogether. Well, he's obviously, he's not calling me to sell everything and give it to the poor. Maybe he's not. I don't think you can absolutely say that with certainty that he's not. I think we all have to really like seek wisdom from God and discernment from other Christian brothers and sisters on if there are certain things that he is calling us to give up for the sake of others and to help meet others' needs. You know, we can, we can also sometimes make excuses about why we're not generous, such as inflation, because that's a real thing, taxation. But when we do these kinds of things, we miss the point, because the point is not to have some sort of perfectly figured out system, it's to have our heart align with God's heart. To have our heart align with his. Not be paralyzed by all the things that we can't do, but think about all the things we can do. Do you see what I'm saying? And think about all the ways that we can care for people and be generous. It's not some complex formula that has to be molded over and over and over and over. It's just simply following an example that Jesus and his disciples lay down and they just practice generosity they just make sure that no one ever has a need that they aren't willing to find a way to meet and i know what you might be able to give and and what might be generous for you might not be the same thing for me right and it's likely not and what my generosity is is probably not what someone else's is 
You know, there's some people in this room right now who could just give $100,000 away right now. Like they have it. It's sitting there. They could just give it if they really wanted to. And they felt God calling them to. They could just do it. They just write that check and it wouldn't hurt them tomorrow at all. And then there's some of us who like giving a hundred dollars would hurt. <laughs> but we could probably still give 10. Everybody can do something, right? I mean, just think about how much money we spend stopping at Starbucks and drinking coffee each week. Think about how much money we spend when we go out and we buy an alcoholic beverage just to socially have a drink with a friend or maybe when we go to the store and we buy beer or wine instead of water. What we can do might be challenging, but we can all do something. And that is really the heart that these Christians, and I hope that we all see and understand, is that, man, like, we can all do something when it comes to generosity. We can all be generous in some way, shape, or form, right? And there are many ways to talk about how we do this, and, um, but I think that's, that's kind of up to you. You figure out how to bless people. You figure out with God, how do I... Um, like follow this example and practice generosity with the, the things that God has entrusted to me. But a lot of times I get questions of like, Derek, where, where should I give, right? And, and how much is the appropriate amount? And a lot of churches will have a lot to say about that, right? <laughs> well, so let's talk about that for just a second, okay? Let's talk about that. Where should you give? Where should you give? Well, I'm going to say, I think there are three primary places that the, the Bible talks about when it comes to where we can give our uh, financial resources that God has blessed us with. The first one is the poor. This is the primary group in which Jesus talks about and makes um, and it makes sense, right? It makes sense that this is the primary group that he talks about because it's the primary group of people in his world. And so he's saying, look, like we can give to the poor, right? I mean, 90% of people in his world were there. That's why he always told his disciples whenever, uh, you know, Judas got upset and the lady like broke this alabaster jar of perfume that could have been sold for far more money, you know, like th those kinds of things, been given as a gift, but it says she used it to anoint Jesus' feet. He... <laughs> He says, look, you're always going to have the poor with you because they're, just, they're everywhere. And so you have a way and you have an opportunity. And even here in America, even though it's maybe less prevalent here in the West and only 10% of people maybe fit into this category in our world and maybe even less in Holly Springs, it doesn't mean that we still can't find places to give to those who are in need locally and around the world. We can find places to bless people who don't have the resources that we have and are actually struggling just to have basic resources to make it through each day. You can find a way to be generous to the poor. It might mean you have to be a little bit more intentional and you might have to go into places that you don't necessarily feel comfortable going into. That's a place of growth for you as a disciple of Jesus. Go into those places Bless those who are hurting and love them. Another place that we hear about is the church. And the church was this place where people entrusted the leaders of the church and, uh, to, to make sure that the resources that they gave were being used rightly. And so they, they used those resources to care for pastors, for the poor, for orphans, for widows. And it's a place where the early church brought possessions so that they could be distributed in whatever way um, that the leaders of the church felt like was going to best advance the gospel and do good in the community. By the fourth century, the church in Galilee was known so much for their generosity that the Roman emperor uh, Julian wrote this. He says, it's disgraceful that the impious Galileans support not only their own poor, but ours as well. All men see our poor lack aid from us. Like the Christians in the early church made the Roman empire look bad because they gave so much. What would it look like 
for Christians to make America look bad because of how much we give versus what welfare programs and things like that could give. And I get it. I understand the church, talking about giving to the church, it's, it's tough, right? Because I know, like, I've experienced it, I've seen it, I've lived it. There's corruption in the church. There's corruption with how finances are used sometimes. It's, it's, it's hard sometimes to trust other people to steward the resources that you're called to steward well. I get it. And can I just be honest from the other side of that? It's hard to steward it well. As a leader in the church, it's not an easy job to make sure that like, we steward every dime that we get in a way that honors God. But I can tell you this. At Lake Springs Church, I can't speak for any other churches. But I know here, the people who have been entrusted to steward what it is that you entrust us with, we take that very seriously. We don't ever, ever make jokes about, like, the finances here. We are, and, and desire to be as transparent as possible, never letting anyone be able to question our integrity or the way in which we handle those things. And so I don't know if that helps you at all, but I just want you to know we take it very, very seriously. It is something we have conversations about all of the time. And we make sure that we do not mess it up or we try not to mess it up as often as we can. And I would just say, if you have questions about that, you want to know more about how the finances are spent, or there's tr you want more transparent understanding of what's going on with the finances at our church, that's a great place for you to take that Connect card that's in front of you and, and, and ask a question to our elders. That's a great place for you to put something before us. That, I love the elders are amen in it. I love it. Uh, so, but, but the... But that's a place where you can put something before us to just truly be honest. And you can do that anonymously. You don't have to put your name on the card. And we'll answer your question. We promise. Any question we receive, we will answer. We will answer it truthfully and transparently. And if we mess it up, we'll be honest and say, hey, we messed it up. But, um, but that's a great place. If you're interested, wondering what's going on, like that's a great place to ask. But here's the other thing that I know about giving to the church is that I'm standing up here and uh, you all provide my livelihood. Like, because of your generosity and because of your provision, I get to live in the house that I live in and drive the cars that I drive and have the clothes that I wear and put the food on the table for my kids that we put on the table. I realize that wholeheartedly, and I am so so grateful for that because what it means for me is I get to do something I love to do. I get to dedicate all of my time and my energy to try and, and figure out ways to continue to advance the kingdom of God here in Holly Springs as it is in heaven. And that is such a beautiful, beautiful thing that I am so blessed to be able to do. And so if you haven't ever heard anyone ever say that before, just I, thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys provide for us so very well. And that doesn't just mean me. It means everybody that's on our staff at our church. David and Vasti are well taken care of. Brian and Brittany and Theo and their kiddos are well taken care of. Jenny and her girls are well taken care of because you guys are generous. And we know, we know that that's where our check comes from. And we are so grateful. So grateful that you guys give generously so that we can do what God's called us to do. And so if you've never heard us say thank you before, thank you. But here's the third place that you can give is just to the gospel. You know, this is about making sure that the gospel gets spread around the corner and around the world, that churches are being planted and started. It's about making sure that unreached people are hearing the gospel and being shown the love of Jesus. And this could look like giving to a mission.
organization or, or uh, someone who works with unreached peoples. This could be uh, doing something or investing in a group that does cultural apologetics here in the West. Maybe this is a, uh, a way in which you give to the local church because you want to see the gospel advance in your local community and in your local city. But some portion of what we give, it should be given to expand the kingdom of God in our city and around the world. Now, so that's, that's where, okay? That's where. Now, let's talk about how much, okay? Let's talk about how much. Now, when asking the question how much, I want to be clear that the New Testament doesn't make any clear statement on what people should give or how much people should give. There is no directive in the New Testament on how much square footage is appropriate for a family of five or six. There's no stipulation in there about how many shoes and how many shirts you're allowed to have in your closet, anything like that, all right? There, there, is, there is nothing like that. But instead, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he says, give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. So there is no set amount. How much you give is directly up to you, and it is directly based on your relationship with God. And you need to give space to ask God and speak with God and let him speak back to you, and you actually listen, okay, when he tells you what is an appropriate amount for you to be generous with and give. But just because it doesn't say that there's an exact number or an exact percentage doesn't mean that we can't also follow some pretty good principles. So let me give you some best practices on how much to give. First thing first is first fruits, no pun intended, okay? Uh, what does this mean? It means that whatever you bring in, before anything else goes out, what it is that you've determined with God is set. Like that is what you're going to give. You don't give out of the leftovers. You don't give out of this place of if I have enough, then I will give. You give first fruits. You give back to God first before anything else. That's the thing that's allocated. When you go to buy a new home or you go to pay rent, you do not go, oh, you know what? If we just pull from our money that we give, we could now afford this place. No. You don't change the money that you give. In fact, if you're making a big decision like that, I would tell you and challenge you to increase what you're going to give if you're going to increase your standard of living, increase your standard of giving. That's what I would say. But I'm crazy, so there you go. <laughs> but give whatever you feel like God has called you to give and give that first before anything else. Another way in which you can practice generosity within the church is to start a generosity fund. I love this idea because many people who are a part of the church already give generously and already have a plan and are consistently generous in some way, but a generosity fund can help you grow as a giver, it can help you grow in your generosity by just thinking about, hey, maybe there's a percentage outside of what I give to all these places that I could just use to bless people's lives. A great way that I heard about this happening uh, recently is I was talking to David about this, our worship leader, who's not here today because he's at another church preaching today. Uh, but, but I was talking to him about it, and I said, you know, um, I think a generosity fund is, is a really cool idea. He goes, yeah, what Vassy and I do is we buy like uh, 10 McDonald's gift cards of $10 every month, and we just give them away when we see someone in need. And I said, well, why don't you just give him Chick-fil-A? And he said, well, I love Chick-fil-A, and I think Chick-fil-A is great, but my, my $10 goes a lot further at McDonald's than it does Chick-fil-A, and I can help somebody more by giving him $10 to McDonald's than I can't give him $10 Chick-fil-A. And so I just thought, man, like he's really thought about this. He's being intentional about saying, man, I really want to bless people. I want to bless them as best as I can. And so here's a way in which I can bless someone when I come in touch with them or when I come in contact with them or when I drive past them on the road or whatever it is, I have these things on the ready. Now you have to plan ahead and you have to be willing to stay committed to it, but you could do it, right? Start a generosity fund. Maybe it's something that you hear of somebody in need within the church or your small group or your life group, whatever it is, you, you just find, oh, here's an opportunity for me to meet a need. 
right? I've been saving up this money as part of my generosity fund. I'm just going to give it away now. God's put somebody in my path to just give it away to and bless and love. Another way in which, uh, or a best practice, is tithing. Um, the word tithe comes from the Hebrew word master, which just means a tenth. So it's not really a money term, it's a mathematics term. Uh, and although that there is no directive in the New Testament to tithe, or that word is not used, it seems to be the staple of what most Christians tend to ascribe to. That like at a bare minimum, I'm going to try and give 10% of whatever it is God has entrusted me with, I'm going to give a bare minimum of that back to the church, organization and missions that do stuff here and globally. Uh, Mallory and I, we give our 10% to Lake Springs, uh, but then we give about another 2% to other places outside of Lake Springs. However, you might decide that, you know what, there are five things that God has laid on your heart and you say that my 10% is gonna go to those five things. That's fine. That's fine. Right? Like, that... You're, you're, I think that's still what I would consider a tithe, right? Even if it doesn't all come to the local church. We love and believe the local church is the hope of the world, and so that's where we put our 10%. And so, but if, if you feel like, you know what, I want to diversify this 10% in different places that my heart is really drawn toward and that I feel like are on God's heart, okay, cool, no problem, right? But that's a great way to practice generosity. And then um, maybe you are already giving a tithe. Maybe you've been tithing for a really, really, really long time. And I would just ask you, when was the last time you went back to God and revisited and had a new conversation with God to say, hey God, um, should I give more? Because I think if we're really truly trying to grow as followers of Jesus, our generosity has to be a part of that too. That we have to continually ask him, how can I grow in this way of trusting you and, and having faith in you? And so uh, I would say another way is a graduated tithe. That's like adding a percentage to your tithe year over year or something like that. And so when you go to 11, the next year you go to 12, and the next year you go to 13, and the next year 14, and so forth and so on. Some people give what's called a reverse tithe, which is giving 90% of their income away and only keeping 10% to live on. That's, my, that, that's, that's literally my generosity and financial goal in my life is that I'll be able to do that. I cannot do that right now, and most of us cannot do that. And I'm not saying that you should cripple your children and your families in order to try to do that. I'm just saying that's, that's something, by the time that I am leaving this earth, I'm hoping and praying that I'm giving more than I'm keeping. And I'm hoping that I'm able to do that and God will bless me. But that takes good stewardship and it takes uh, continually being generous so God will give me more to be generous on every occasion with. And so, um, so, anyway, so those are some best practices for how much or a way to think about how much, okay? Hopefully that's helpful. Now let me challenge you with this next step as we close out this series. I just want to challenge you with this next step, okay? If you don't have a budget, please make a budget. If you need help making a budget, please call me. Please call me. Call me tonight. Leave me a message because I'm not going to answer it. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> But call me as soon as you feel like you need some help with a budget. I will help you create a budget. It, that, that probably goes for any of our leaders here at the church. But like we will help you build a budget so that you can stick to a budget because that's really, really important. But I would encourage you to share your budget with a trusted friend and a trusted Christian companion Share with them your generosity plans, your generosity aspirations. Guys, following Jesus and practicing the way of Jesus cannot be done on our own. We need a community to help us. And I know that some of you will be like, well, I share my budget with my financial advisor. And that's all well and good, except for your financial advisor is making money off of you. And, and hopefully your Christian community won't but they'll ask questions that I think like really draw out the heart of God in a major powerful way that's good and, um, and transformative in your life. 
The other thing that I realize is that, man, like, some of your money, if you go with a financial advisor, they're going to want to put your money in some accounts that are giving money to businesses that, quite honestly, are not doing things that would be things God would be proud of or happy with. Like, they'll make you a lot of money. You'll, you'll become a very wealthy person following their directives, but you also might be funding slavery and sex trafficking and just unbiblical and unrighteous ways of being and doing things in the world. These are things we have to think about, things we have to ask questions about. We can't just think that anytime we throw some money somewhere and it starts to make more, like that's, that's a good thing. It might be a good thing. And so having trusted community to say, well, hey, this is what I got. What do you think? And go, yeah, oh, that's really good. Or, hmm, it looks to me like, you know, you might actually be able to pay for your children to go to college if you would stop eating Chick-fil-A. <laughs> or whatever, right? It's just one of those things. Like, just, just uh, invite people into it with you because they're going to, to help you. You know, uh, you guys know this. Um, I just felt as I was preparing, especially this morning, um, I just felt like the Holy Spirit was laying it on my heart to, to challenge our church today. Um, you know, we just experienced, or at least there are a lot of people in our state and around our state who recently experienced some really devastating circumstances when it comes to uh, their livelihood and their way of life. Many people have lost so much in the wake of these storms that have passed through in the last week. And so uh, I... I sent out a quick message to our elders this morning and just said, hey, this is what I want to do. And our elders all said unanimously, yeah, I think that's great. Let's do it. And so here's, here's what we're going to do. Anything that is given today in our generosity boxes that you see at the back of our room, whether that's cash or check, anything that you put in there, we're going to give 100% of that to people in need um, that have been impacted and devastated by the storms that have taken place in our, in our uh, state. Um, and so I know there are, there are probably people that you know uh, that live in those places that have been impacted. Uh, there are probably people that you know that um, if they're not personally impacted, they're one person removed from somebody who is, a neighbor or a friend. And so we're just gonna, we're gonna find and try and steward those resources as best we can and find where it's gonna bless as many people as possible. But it's an opportunity for us to practice generosity together as a community. And so I know we don't carry around checkbooks very often and, uh, and those kinds of things. So here's the other thing that I'll say is, um, is uh, I'll have Brian do this as well. Brian, if you'll create a giving fund on our online giving that just says storm relief or something like that, uh, then, then if you go online and you give online and you click that storm relief tab instead of the general fund, uh, then, then we'll give all of that money uh, away as well, 100% of it, okay? We really, really believe that God has put us here to steward his resources well and do good bringing his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And so I just, let's all do it together, all right? Let's pray. God, we, um, we thank you that uh, we are able to be here in this beautiful building. God, thank you for protecting us uh, from the storms that we experienced this past week. Thank you for uh, just getting us all here to this day. God, it is just a uh, picture of your goodness and your grace and your generosity and your love. God, I pray that you will, um, man, let us never forget that. Let us never see uh, ourselves as, as, uh, as children of a God who has nothing, but, but that we are children of a God who has it all and who can richly bless us 
in every way so that we can bless others. God, I also just... um, God, I'm just struck by the fact that by the riches of your grace, we've been saved. By the riches of your glorious grace, we have hope and a future. Because you pulled us out of the muck and the mire and you saved us and redeemed us by your broken body and shed blood. And so God, thank you for that. Thank you for raining down this generous love and this generous grace on us all. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.